We're going to continue in 1 John in chapter 2. We're actually going to finish this chapter today. But I want to first start off by calling your attention to some warning signs. And I believe Brother Sammy should have a slide for us. What does that sign mean? Do not enter. What are the purpose of warning signs like this? It, to keep us out of harm, to get our attention so that we can heed the instruction. And so we'll drive down a road, and if we see a sign like this, and if we turn on that side of the highway, chances are it's not going to be very good, is it? We're going to be at risk for running head on with another car. We may see a, a sign that looks like this. Usually you see those in restrooms or somewhere where people have mopped. And that sign should catch your attention. That, hey, the floor is wet. If you're going to walk too fast, you're going to slip and you are going to hurt yourself. See it all the time. Used to when I worked in the hospital. People would <coughs> fracture their hips and they would fall because they neglected to see the wet floor sign and to be safe. And you may even see a sign like this. Rough road. Have you ever seen any of those? And if you're going 75 and you see a rough road sign, you may bust a tire and it could be very dangerous, right? Those are just some example of warning signs that are around us all day long. Every day when we go to work, it doesn't have to necessarily be road signs. It could be signs within our church. Um, it could be signs at home to protect you, maybe from high voltage or whatever. Or if you're going on a property, it may say, beware of dog. Those signs stand as an indicator for us that we need to pay attention and heed the information that's on that sign, right? None of us in here, I believe, in our right mind would ever turn on a road that says do not enter because we know what could happen, right? I believe all of us are intelligent enough to do that very thing. Same with the rough road. We're going to adjust our speed accordingly based off of that rough road. Or if you grew up in the mountains like I did in Kentucky, um, you're all flat here. We had winding roads. I think they followed a snake when they would pave the roads there. And if you're driving too fast and you're not following the speed limit and catch that caution sign, I have actually lost people I graduated with because they were driving too fast on that road and they wrecked and lost their lives. So those warning signs are meant to protect us, right? So when we come to... 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 through 29, John is going to lay out for us a warning sign, a sign that should catch our attention, a sign that we need to take heed of this morning, each and every person in here. And he lays it out for us today. And failure to heed the warning is going to be like turning on that road with a do not enter sign. Or it's going to be like power walking in a restroom, neglecting that wet floor sign. You're going to slip and fall and hurt yourself. So let's look to see what the Apostle John has to say to us, <clears throat> beginning in verse 18. He says, Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. By this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. However, they went out so that it might be made clear that none of them belongs to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I have not written to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar if not the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This one is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. He who confesses the Son has the Father as well. What you have heard from the beginning is to remain in you. If what you have heard from the beginning remains in you, then you will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He has made to us, eternal life. I have written these things to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you don't need anyone to teach you. Instead, his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie. Just as it is taught you, remain in him. And John closes in chapter 2. So now, little children, remain in him 
so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know this as well. Everyone who does what is right has been born of him. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you, Lord, again for this day. I pray that you bless the reading of your word. Father, open our eyes and ears to your truth. And Father, may each person today position themselves in a way to hear from you clearly. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and amen. All right, and so <clears throat> let me get a drink of water here. What's the warning that John provides? What's the warning that he provides? He basically says, caution, you're living in the last hour, is what he says. You're living in the last hour. In other words... You're living in the final period of history before Jesus' second coming. You're living in it. John's readers in the first century, at the end of the first century, were living in the last days. John, as an apostle, as a follower of Jesus, when Jesus came, John was living in the last days. The last days is not referring to necessarily um, time, as much as it is the kind of time that we're living in. And so John is saying, that's the warning sign, you're living in the last hour, and because you're living in the last hour, you need to know what to expect. The time is going to change. The terrain is going to get rough, and you need to be prepared, and you need to know what's going on because you're living in the last hour. And so that is the title of the message this morning, Living in the Last Hour. What can we come to expect? Not only what does living in the last hour, what is it characterized by, what does it look like, what should we expect, what's around us right at this moment, but also how do we respond in this last hour that we're living? How do we respond and what is our responsibility to it? And that's what John starts off by. He is saying, listen, pay attention. And so the first section I want to call your attention to is this, is the presence of of false teachers. That's what he starts off with right off the bat, right? He says, you're living in the last hour. And he's addressing it to the church. And he says, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, and even now many Antichrists have come. John uses the word here, Antichrist. That is a compound word in the original language. Anti meaning against or opposed, right? or Christos, which stands for Messiah or Christ. And so when John is saying, you know that in the last hour, the Antichrist is coming. So he first uses it in the singular sense, that the last days, the coming of the Antichrist, the one who is going to oppose Christ, who's going to try to replace him, the one who's going to be fueled by Satan. He is dark. He is domineering. He is deceitful. And he is going to captivate the people in the tribulation. He tells his readers, you know he's coming. And you know he's coming because you heard the truth. The apostolic teachings made evidence of that. And they believed it. So he refers to it in the singular sense. The Antichrist is coming. Paul didn't use the word Antichrist. The word Antichrist is specific to the apostle John. Paul uses a word and a phrase he says, the man of lawlessness. In the majority of translations, that's how it's rendered. The King's James and the New King's James renders that the, the man of sin. And we know that sin is lawlessness. So even though Paul doesn't use the word antichrist in his writings, John and Paul are talking both about the same individual, that the last day will be characterized by this man of lawlessness. And... Um, 2 Thessalonians, if you would turn your attention there, we'll read so you can see it. it. Takes me a minute, my. All right. In 2 Thessalonians, if you'll flip over to chapter 2, in verses 3 and 4, look what Paul has to say. He says, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come, talking about the coming, the second coming. Of Jesus, that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first, the falling away, and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, 
the man doomed to destruction. Look in verse 4. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God, little g, or object of worship, so that he sits in God's temple proclaiming that he himself is God. And then, like John, Paul noted that as the world anticipates the coming of the Antichrist, they can come to expect that the spirit of the Antichrist is at work in our day-to-day. It was at work in their day-to-day. It's in our work, work in our day now in 2023. Look at what he says in verse 7 of chapter 2 in 2 Thessalonians. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but the one now restraining will do so until he is out of the way. But the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. And so he says, you know that this Antichrist is coming. It's going to be characterized by that. However, don't be waiting on the second coming of Jesus. The Antichrist has not risen yet. He's not in power yet. We're not in the tribulation yet. And you need to be aware that in this last hour, there are many Antichrists living among you. He uses the word in the plural sense, talking about the false teachers, the deceivers, those who oppose Jesus and his teachings, those who want to get in and confuse the congregation and cause division and then get on their way. The ones who are posers, who wants to pose that they have something that they don't actually possess. He is saying there are antichrists among you. Not only are there antichrists among you, they're increasing in their number and they're increasing in their influence. That's how you know you're living in the last hour. Even though the Antichrist in 2023 has not risen and is reigning, there are Antichrists in Bryan College Station. There are Antichrists across our nation. There are Antichrists within our churches working against the purpose of God, while maybe even believing they have something that they don't have because their teachings don't back up their profession. And so John is saying, you know, (laughs) you know the end times, you know that Christ is going to come back for you, you know the Antichrist is going to reign, and you need to pay attention because you are going to be at risk for being tossed to and fro by these false teachings if you're not paying attention. And if we neglect this warning sign from John, it's going to be detrimental to our walk for the Lord. And if a person is here this morning that doesn't know Jesus as Savior, not a Christian, a born-again Christian, he is going to blind you so that you're going to neglect the warning sign that we're sharing this morning of coming to faith in Christ. And so John gives us some traits of the false teacher. And how I'm going to do this the rest of this morning, because John... He starts talking about the false teachers, and he talks about the Christians, and he talks about the false teachers, and he talks about the Christians. So what we're going to do, we're first going to consider what are the traits of false teachers? What are they characterized by? And then we're going to talk about what is our response in this world today? What is our response today? Okay? So the first trait that he points out is found in verse 19 whenever... He says, they went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. However, they went out so that it might be made clear that none of them belongs to us. The first trait is departure from the fellowship. Departure from the fellowship. When he says they, he's referring to the false teachers. And when he says us, it's referring to the fellowship of believers, the genuine believers. It says that they went out. Think about this with me. They went out from us. What does that mean? Well, in order to go out, you have to be in, right? So that tells us that many false teachers get their start from within the church. Because if they're going to go out, they have to be in, right? And he says they went out from us. So many teachers, false teachers in our day, are Bible. They grew up in a Bible-believing church. They know the lingo. They know the, the, the words to say, the right things to say, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are true born-again Christians because they departed from the fellowship, John said. And remember, these Gnostics, these false teachers, 
they infiltrated the church, they caused chaos, and then they left. But they just didn't leave by themselves. What do you think happened? Many people followed after them and their teachings. Not only did people follow after them, so then you, you take a group of people and they leave. It leaves a hole in the fellowship, right? And so it would be easy to be like, where's everybody going? Why are they leaving? Are they teaching something that we don't know? The Gnostics claim to have this superior knowledge. What do they know that we don't know? Why are so many people leaving? Our church is dying. And so John is writing to encourage them, no, no, no. They departed from your fellowship because they were never truly part of your fellowship. They weren't born-again Christians. And the, the fact that they departed from the fellowship gives evidence to the fact that what they believed was false and it has no root. Make sense? That first trait is they departed from the faith. But it doesn't mean that every false teacher had their beginning within the church. Many false teachers come without, outside of the church to try to attack the church. Paul says in Acts chapter 20, he warned the elders of the church of Ephesus and he said this, he said, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. What imagery there. Savage wolves will come in and they're not going to spare the flock. But then he does go on to say, in verse 30, and from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. So they come from without, they come from within, they're everywhere, and they're increasing in number. That's why Paul says in Acts 20, verse 31, be on alert. John may not say, be on alert right here, but you, you hear the urgency when you read it. You're in the last hour. And these are how the days are characterized. They went out from us. They did not belong. If they would have belonged, they would have remained. But they didn't remain, so they went out. So it would be clear. It would give you evidence that they didn't belong. Second John, verse 9, John goes on to say, Anyone who does not remain in Christ's teaching but goes beyond it does not have God. The one who remains in that teaching, this one has both the Father and the Son. And friends, we know that in the last days, what Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he says, Now the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons, the teachings of demons, through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared. That is heavy language, right? The imagery there. False teaching is the teaching of demons. Why? Because it is against Christ. And any teaching that goes against Christ outside of His Word that isn't in the light that we talked about, that John is saying, walk in the light, not the darkness. Okay? So if it's not in the light and it's darkness, it's dangerous. It's dangerous and it can be damning for somebody for all of eternity. They are going to flock. People will flock to a message or a center that tickles their ears and tells them what they want to hear. But the message, if it's not rooted in the truth of God's Word, and it doesn't portray Christ correctly and accurately, the need for Him as Savior, the truth that He is God in flesh, those teachings are teachings of demons because they oppose Christ. They have the spirit of the Antichrist. So they depart from the fellowship, and I led right into it. The second trait is the denial of Christ. The denial of key, fundamental, and foundational Christian doctrines of the faith. You cannot be a Christian and not believe correctly about Jesus. Now, I'm not saying you're going to know Jesus perfectly because we're in the flesh. But you can learn more about him and his nature. And you can believe correctly about Jesus because we have his inspired word right in front of us. Amen. You cannot. Underline it. It's a promise. It's a guarantee. You cannot be a Christian and not believe correctly about the person of Jesus. You cannot be a Christian and not see yourself as a sinner before a holy God in need of a Savior. You cannot be a Christian and fail to believe the work that was done on the cross on your behalf. 
that that Christ, that man that was God in flesh did all of the work and that you depend totally on him. If that's not the case, you're not a Christian. The false teachers denied Christ. What does he say? Verse 22. Who is the liar? He calls them liars. Who is the liar? Not the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. That's who it is. The one that denies Jesus is the Christ. Doesn't have the Father. John has no time to waste. No time to pull punches. No time to, to tiptoe around it. It's serious. And if it was serious in his day, how much more serious is it in our day? In 2023, right? He doesn't have time. He's saying, you're in the last hour. And many antichrists have come. And they are poisoning the church. And they need to be called out. But you need to know how to respond. Don't, get, uh, don't, don't fret if many people leave true teaching and turn to error. You try to win them and you try to witness to them. But at the end of the day, if they follow false teaching and they refuse... They refuse to acknowledge Jesus as Lord and the true teachings, foundation. I'm talking about all these tertiary issues that we have in churches. I'm talking about key, fundamental beliefs of the Christian faith. If they refuse to believe and they depart from the fellowship and they go after false teachers in places that call themselves churches under ministers and it's not founded in the truth of God's word, it is evidence that they were never part of the true fellowship and family of God. That's not me saying this. That is God's word. That's what John is saying. And there's urgency there. So many teachers in even our community, and it's sad to me, are teaching heresy. A person should never feel comfortable in their sin. If you feel comfortable in your sin or apathetic towards your sin, That is your first indicator that you need Jesus. They departed from the fellowship. They deny Christ. The third is deceptive teaching, which all goes together of what I've been talking about this morning. Verse 26, I have written these things to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. They are trying to deceive. Satan is a counterfeit. Anytime the truth shows up or the truth is presented... Satan sets up shop. He sets up shop, no matter where it is, in the church, out of the church, wherever the truth is presented, he's right there. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. The distraction of social media, all around us, everything's accessible. But so is God's Word. God's Word is more accessible now than it has ever been. (laughs) So we have just as much access, easy access to God's inspired Word as we do all of the filthy things going on in our culture, all of the voices telling us what we should do, who we should be, how we should live, how we should behave, what we shouldn't say, what we can say, what we should never say. And all along, we are falling prey to that ideology. We have the same access to God's Word, and God wants us to know the truth. He speaks to us through His Word. The la- living in the last hour is characterized by these false teachers. The rise in the heresy. And it's serious. I can't be more emphatic enough about it. Because it's dangerous. And what's sad about it is people fall prey to it and they have no idea. No idea. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, here it is, folks. Here's the danger. Here's the danger. Paul says in chapter 11 and verse 3, But I fear that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your minds may be seduced from the sincere and pure devotion to Christ. That's his goal. His goal is to twist the truth, to distort it, to confuse you, to bring chaos in the church because he deceived mankind from the beginning and caused them to doubt God and to turn away from God to their own understanding. And we saw the result of it and we're living it, right? There is nothing about your pastor that is perfect. The only thing perfect about your pastor is the fact that I have the Holy Spirit within me. 
Jesus Christ living within me who is perfect. That is the only thing perfect about me. And so in the spirit I'm perfect, but not in my flesh I'm not perfect. And I've had to learn some of these things the hard way myself. We talked about the pitfalls last week, chapter, uh, verses 12 through 17 of 2 John. The all that's in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Those are pitfalls that the enemy uses every time. These false teachers, you know what they want to do? They want to, they want to um, puff up your ego. They want to make you feel good. And they want to tell you what you want to hear. If that's happening, then you, you pretty much can tell. That's your indicator, your red flag, your siren. Whoa! And there's times that I don't need to hear what you think I want. I, want, I need to hear what I need to hear and what God needs me to hear, yeah. not what I want to hear. Yeah. Those are usually two different things, by the way. So those are the traits of the false teachers, and we have modern-day cults in our community today that are perverting and leading people astray. Just down the road, I've mentioned this before, where close to where I used to work at the hospital, they're, they're building a Unitarian Universalist church there, and many people are going to flock to that church, but it's not a church. Their teaching does not, is not in accordance to and believing in the deity of Jesus Christ. They don't believe that Jesus was Christ and God in flesh. Their doctrine primarily says that he was a good prophet, a moral teacher. That's heresy. You have Christian science, big religious movement, about spiritual healing and power of the mind, but they deny the deity of Jesus. You have the... Mormon Church, right? The, the, the Church of Latter-day Saints. And I am name-dropping. I understand that. It may be uncomfortable for some of you. But they're around us. And people are being led astray. The, the Mormons don't believe that the Trinity is together. They believe that God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son are separate beings. Well, that's incorrect belief about the Trinity. How can you be a Christian and believe those things? Jehovah's Witness. They believe Jesus was the created being, the first and most highest, but not equal to God. Well, that's a wrong belief about Jesus. Okay? It's all around us. And it's okay to say these things. If we know people that are under those teachings, to love them enough to tell them the truth, to love them enough to kindly, carefully, thoughtfully share the truth, not abrasively and arrogantly, but why is this the truth? Why do they need to know this? Because eternity is in the balance. Their destiny for eternity is hanging. And they're walking into a burning building and none of us are saying anything. We're letting them walk into a burning building. We need to love them enough to go and tell them the truth. To share with them why Jesus came. That God loves them. Show them the truth. Because when they're presented with the truth, then it's up to them to decide what to do with it. You're not responsible for the outcome, but you are responsible for sharing the, the good news, right? Amen? Can I get an amen? Now, how do we respond to this information? How do we do this? Because God doesn't leave us helpless and hopeless in these last hours, in the time that we're living in. Look with me in verse 20. We're going to read 20 through 21 and jump to 27. It says, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I have not written to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Verse 27, As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you don't need anyone to teach you. Instead, his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true, and is not a lie, just as it has taught you remain in him. The first response as a Christian is to embrace the anointing of the Holy Spirit in your life. When he says you receive an anointing, he is referring to you have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And what does God's Word tell us about the ministry of the Holy Spirit? In His Word, He tells us that the Holy Spirit came to do what? To teach. To teach us truth. Right? To teach us what is true. So embracing the Holy Spirit as a Christian is saying, I am going to depend on the Holy Spirit to lead me and to guide me. 
because the Holy Spirit came that Jesus loved enough, me enough to send the Spirit to indwell me so that I know what way to walk. I know how to talk. I know where to go because I have His Spirit in me. Embracing that Holy Spirit is key. Here's the thing. We talked about this in Sunday school today too. I told him, I said, pretend like you're surprised. You've never heard this before. If you are a child of God, you have the same amount of the Holy Spirit as the Apostle Paul and as the Apostle John. Do you realize that? It is impossible to have a little bit of the Holy Spirit and a lot of the Holy Spirit. Or you have the Holy Spirit now and it allows you to do all these special miraculous things and He's going to leave you and He's going to come back and bless you again. No. Holy Spirit comes to make residence in you and you have the full Holy Spirit upon the moment of your salvation. Here's the problem. And I'm speaking to me first. Anytime I do this, I have been there and I'm speaking to myself and I step on my own toes. Think of uh, satellite TV. It has to have signal, right? And the satellite gives it signal so that you can have a picture on, on the television, right? But let's say you live in a wooded area and your satellite dish is not positioned to receive the signal. What's going to happen? Are you going to get to sit down to watch the Aggie game? No. Or in my case, the Kentucky Wildcats, but you all don't care about that. But I'm going to just, we'll just talk Aggie talk. You're not going to get to watch TV because the signal is interrupted. It's the, 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 the satellite dish is not positioned in a way to receive a message from the satellite. So that's what happens in the Christian life. We all have the same Holy Spirit, but are we positioning ourselves in a way to receive the signal from God to hear Him clearly? Well, if you're not embracing the Holy Spirit, chances are your signal is clouded and there's something in the way that has to be moved out of the way so that you can hear from God and embrace that anointing of the Holy Spirit. Make sense? Okay. Second responsibility that we have is to abide in the truth of God's Word. Now, you can't know the truth apart from the Holy Spirit. That's salvation. You can't abide in God's truth without the help of the Holy Spirit. So that's why we start with embracing the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Then you abide in the truth of God's Word in these last hours. Look with me in verse 21. Not 21. I made a correction and I did not communicate that. Verse 24 through 25. I'm a human, right? Verse 24. What you have heard from the beginning is to remain in you. If what you have heard from the beginning remains in you, then you will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He Himself has made to us eternal life. So we have this anointing. We receive the Holy Spirit. He reveals to us the truth. And what we have heard from the beginning since salvation, we are to keep it. We are to remain in the truth of God's Word. We are to treasure this above all things. We're to treasure what God has to say above all things. This, yes, this even means above my emotions and my feelings. I believe it was Warren Wiersbe that said that it's not enough to be sincere in your beliefs. We can be sincere about all kinds of things, can't we? We can have sincerely held beliefs, but if we aren't correct, then we can be sincerely wrong. Okay? In the Christian life, we have his word we need to remain in it that's what it means to abide to remain is to continue in his truth it is when you're living in the last hour and something catches you strange or you're confused and you need direction you need guidance you turn to this god what do you have to say let's see how the church of ephesus how to deal with this let's see let's read jesus's letters to the seven churches let's read up read the gospels let's see how jesus interacted with with religious leaders who were posing that they were super religious but they weren't even christians they were putting so many restrictions and laws and all these things how did jesus respond to those types of people how did jesus respond to sinners how did jesus this book gives you wisdom and direction and guidance, but it does you no good if you don't pick it up. It's like driving past a sign, an exit sign, and you're wondering where you need to go and how you're going to get off the highway, but you keep passing the signs that tell you, exit now. Oh, I think it's on up the road. Well, the GPS is saying, exit now. And then nobody in here is smarter than Siri. <laughs> I'm being silly. 
It's like, oh, I think I can get there a different way. And you all know as well as I do, one wrong turn in Houston, you could be stuck in traffic forever. Yeah, reroute. But it does no good if we're not going to listen. That GPS, I know you said rerouting. The GPS does us no good if we're not going to listen to it. Same thing with God. We embrace the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We abide in the truth of His Word. And then our third and final responsibility is to remain steadfast in Jesus. Okay? Verses 28 through 29, he says, So now, in light of all of these things, little children, remain in Him, so that when He appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. If you know that He is righteous, you know this as well. Everyone who does right is of Him. Okay? Has been born of Him. And it is possible for Christians to be accepted but not acceptable, right? I love my daughter, and she's always accepted as a father, and as you all as parents to your children, but they may do things that you, they, they may not be in an acceptable state because of choices that they've made. They're accepted, but they're not acceptable. So in the Christian life, it can be the same way. John does not, does not teach, and people will try to twist his words. John is not saying that Christians can lose their salvation and that you have to maintain your, your salvation. He said, I'm writing to you so that you know that you have eternal life. Remaining in the Word is being faithful to the Word. Remaining and, and cherishing and embracing and depending on the Holy Spirit, that gives you the ability to know what to do. But you know as well as I do, if you neglect His guidance, you're going to face consequences, right? right? If you're not in His Word, you're not going to be hearing clearly from Him. You're not going to understand. doesn't mean you're not a Christian. As long as your life isn't characterized by, here's the key, and this is the kicker of John, as long as your life is not characterized by continual, repetitive, habitual sin and walking in darkness without any remorse, without any confession, then according to the Bible, that is evidence of a false faith. That's what John says. John does not say you can lose it. John is writing to encourage them to say that you can know that you know that you belong to God. And this is how you can know. <laughs> and he says, remain in Christ. So that when he comes, because we're living in the last hour, the last period, and he's coming, do you want to be found in a state of obedience and devotion and love to Jesus? Or do you want to be found in disobedience and walking in darkness at the moment of his coming? To have confidence that Jesus is coming means that if we're abiding in this word and if we are embracing the Holy Spirit, that we'll have confidence not in ourselves. Oh, look at me. No. We'll have confidence in our relationship and our standing with God because we are walking in the light as He is in the light. We are drawing near to Him. He is making us ever aware of a sin in our life. And as He makes us aware of the sin in our life, we are confessing it to Him and trusting that His sacrifice on the cross paid for it in full and He enables us to live rightly for Him. Amen? Amen. That's what John says in his letter. That's what he's telling us today. Now, I'll close with this. Recently, we went to uh, Corpus Christi at the beginning of um, July with the family. Went to Corpus Christi, went to the beach, and it was very windy. And so anytime it's very windy, the waves are harsher, okay? Now, we went to Galveston and, you know, few weeks before that and we caught it at a bizarre time apparently because the water was crystal clear it looked it was beautiful and everybody tells me well Galveston's never that way it was when we went my daughter liked Galveston better because the waves weren't as harsh and so I went out into the water with her so that she could get over her fear because she had never seen waves like that and we went out a little bit and I happened to turn and I lost my footing and you know what happened have you ever been in the ocean with unsettled waves? Okay, you don't just lose your footing and fall. <laughs> you look so silly trying to get up. Because every time, I made sure Juliana got up, every time I tried to get up, there come another wave. <laughs> Crash knocked me down. Try to pull the trunks up because it, everything was just hitting me. <laughs> and there, the timing wasn't even like, okay, you know, you can usually... It was just like, it was like getting off the offbeat or something. I don't know. It kept hitting me. 
That's how life will be if we're not in tune to the Holy Spirit and what God has to say. If we're not abiding in Him and following Him, we're going to be like I was out in the Corpus Christi beach being tossed to and fro by the waves at their mercy, <laughs> okay, by the false teaching. And that's why it's so important to listen and take heed of what God's saying to, to us through His Word. Amen? That's why it's important. So, now, this message isn't only to encourage you, encourage the Christians in here of how to live in the last hour, okay? If you have a decision to make for the Lord, if, if you feel He is speaking to your heart, I encourage you to talk to God, to confess your sin, because He wants to save you, and He loves you. And if you need to talk about that or know what to do, to know how to respond, or you just need prayer, I am more than happy to pray with you. If you have not joined a church community, I want to invite you to become part of our family today. Because it is crucial in the Christian life to join yourself to a, a church family, to serve. Yeah. Attending is great. It is great, admirable. But God's Word should always lead us to want to fellowship with the believers and to belong and to be and to serve Him with the community of believers. So I want to invite you to do that this morning if God is putting that on your heart. We're not perfect, okay? We're not perfect. There's not a perfect church. If you think that you find a perfect church, the moment you join it, it becomes imperfect, okay? There's no perfect church. But we sure do love Jesus. We love to serve Him. We love to serve one another. In our church, you'll find a place that is welcoming, encouraging. You'll grow in your walk with the Lord because we all have the same focus and vision of wanting to live lives that are pleasing to the Lord. And so if God puts that on your heart and you want to talk more about what does, it become, what does it take to become a member of our family, I'm happy to talk to you about that too. God knows the needs. If you just need prayer, that I trust in these moments that you will, you will listen to the Lord and that you will respond as he's leading you, okay?